Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Stead from Vanderbilt University, and um, I'm going to moderate uh, session three, which is on systems approaches and models of care delivery for cancer care. Um, all through the morning, there have been calls for more systemists, and hopefully our, our panel uh, will provide some insight into that. Um, what we're going to do is to do the presentations, um, and t we have time built in for one clarifying question if people want to at the end of um, each presentation uh, before we have the panel discussion. We've got a set of questions we are going to try to answer through first the presentations, which will provide examples, and then we will talk about them interactively um, as a panel afterwards. So that's sort of the structure that we're going to try to do. And Mary Zuter, who is a colleague of mine from Vanderbilt, will lead off on diagnostic management teams. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Bill, and th thank the committee for having me. I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, and this is an area that is very exciting to me. And what I'm going to talk about today is how Vander diagnostic management teams at Vanderbilt have really um, improved patient access to very good cancer care and how we can use that as an example um, moving forward. And I'm, I'm hoping that I'll answer a number of the questions that were raised today. Oh, this is... How do I go forward? Ah, thank you. Um, what we're going to talk about today is sort of where we are today in cancer care at many institutions. Uh, an example of an end-to-end -end systems process that we've developed, um, where we want to go in the future, and some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, we have, as we know, a number of different views of cancer. Um, this is a, an image put together by me, Olivia, a long time ago to work on a breast diagnostic management team. And we know that the view of the patient in, with cancer is very, very depending on our perspective. The clinician, as I show him up at the very top, the oncologist sees the patient as a, as a human being. Um, the radiologist has multiple different images that they can view a patient with cancer. The pathologist has a completely different view from what was originally taught us as the routine morphology uh, a long time ago with H&Es and immunohistochemistries, now to arrays, NGS and sequencing analyses. And um, the, the problem is really integrating all of that information and seeing the patient. This is how our physicians probably feel today. They are completely overwhelmed with all of the information and don't really know what to do with their patients. And so what we're trying to do is really solve this problem. The problem is, is that we've, this is what we've talked about all day today. Each of us reside in our own silo. We've used this word silo so many times today. And so pathology is in its silo, radiology is in its silo. The clinician is involved with trying to see so many patients on a given day that they don't have time to do a lot of the work that they would really like to have, have done. And so this is an old, old slide that we've been using for a number of years. And this is the traditional practice of pathology, where a physician, a provider, orders a number, sees a patient and orders a whole bunch of tests and literally throws those tests over the wall through an EHR system of ordering to the laboratory. The, la the laboratory, without ever considering what's really being requested, does all of those tests and throws all the results back to the physician and leaves the physician, the provider, the oncologist, and we said this before, you know, the community practice doctor, with the effort of having to pull all those different tests from multiple different sources into something that they will allow them to take care of the patient. This is an example in hematopathology, and I'm trained as a hematopathologist. And so as we see, this is really starting off with a patient with acute leukemia that comes into a clinic. And there are multiple, multiple different kinds of testing that goes to numerous different laboratories. The patient comes in with a relatively unclear history, a little bit of fever, not feeling well, and what they really have to go on is the fact that the patient has a certain number of blasts circulating malignant cells. So when the 
physician wants to order something, they have a large test menu, and there are very, very few, if no, evidence-based guidelines for what to do with that with those testing. The tests, once they're ordered, go to, goes to multiple different laboratories. At some institutions, they go to multiple laboratories within the institution. In some community hospital settings, they go to multiple different laboratories throughout the country. And then what comes back are multiple reports with no comprehensive interpretation of what all of those reports mean, which lead the, the provider for, with no real answer to give the patient, and the patient even more confused than they started out. And so the traditional mo model of pathology really has provided all of these limits to medicine, and it's only getting worse with the whole gamut of new testing that comes online on a weekly, daily basis. So the consequences are many increased uh, unnecessary tests with increased cost, inefficient workflow for both the physician, the pathologist, the pathologist, and uh, inability to really correlate and interpret all of the results. So what we've done at Vanderbilt, and this was really initiated about six years ago, and the hematopathology DMT started five years ago, and so I can show you the historical perspective of this. Um, it was a really a collaboration between the pathologist, the, the oncologist, and the informaticians to develop a set of clinical decision support, but we weren't providing the clinical decision support as we discussed in the last hour. We developed a system of SOPs, or standard ordering protocols, that everyone agreed on at the, at the beginning, and I'll show you what those look like. We then um, developed algorithms to support those standards. We then, all the laboratory results were generated in, the, in our laboratory. We changed the way all of the reporting structure was performed because you can't do what we were doing in Cerner or any EHR system that's available now. And then we were able to bring all of that data together at the end and generate a comprehensive interpretive report that was extremely valuable, as I'll try to show you. We also continued to uh, take the learnings from each of those standards and each of all the evidence that we generated to improve the algorithms over a yearly, every six-month basis. And so what we did was we really developed a set of standard ordering procedures that allowed the physician to just order a bone marrow, bone marrow testing panel. The pathologist would look at the blood or the bone marrow, and based on the stage of disease and what one saw in the bone marrow, would define all of the testing that was going to be done on that bone marrow. The testing was performed, and then the pathologist was required to put together a comprehensive report integrating the cytogenetics, the molecular testing, the flow cytometry, and the morphology report. And that comprehensive report would then be provided to the physician. This is the way we started out with our standard ordering protocols. Um, as you can see, we divided it up by disease process and then stage of disease. This was very much easier to envision in hematopathology because the courses of these diseases are often relatively short as far as the, when you're staging the patient. So a patient often came in with original diagnosis, and we would have a, a certain set of, of algorithms for a new diagnostic patient with AML, ALL, and I'll show you all of the diseases we've now done. A patient would come back for follow-up who had no overt disease. You wouldn't want to do the same everything for the patient at that point. You would want to really um, dissect out specific testing that was based on the original diagnostic testing to decide what to do at that point. And then we're also at, at Vanderbilt, a large bone marrow transplant center. And so we had um, specific protocols for pre-bone marrow transplant and for post-bone marrow transplant for all of the diseases. So these are the diseases that we have developed so far. We started out with acute myeloid dis disorders, myeloid AML and a myelodysplastic syndrome, and then we did um, myeloproliferative neoplasms. We now have acute lymphoblastic leukemia, T-cell ALL, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, bone marrow failure, and multiple myeloma. These were, and for each of these diseases, we actually have a set of SOPs at all of the different stages of progression. These were not initially electronically generated. These were literally SOPs that were written on paper. We made them rather professional because we took them off to, to um, someone and put plastic coating on them so that they weren't completely torn up every day at the, at the microscope. But this is what we used for the first really three to four years um, were these SOPs. And I can show you that the results have been really remarkable. 
I also told you that at the other end, after all of the testing is done, we've generated and we, we, we generate a comprehensive interpretive report. Um, when when the, the health IT folks showed me that I could do this, I thought a miracle had occurred, truly. Because what we did, we really changed the way all of our reporting is done in hematopathology. That includes the morphology, the cytogenetics, the flow cytometry. Um, and it wasn't really being done in Cerner at all. It's done on an external application that we've now developed. Um, so the data is generated discreetly. We then asked our providers if they wanted a discrete sort of summary report or if they wanted a, an English version report like they were used to. They actually wanted the English version report, but the data was being entered discreetly so that we can pull it and mission mash it wherever we want. And so we could then pull that data into a comprehensive report that had all of the data um, integrated into one report. And then the pathologists, our ultimate job was to take all of that data and say, this data means this. So we had the results from all of the different laboratories, and now we've added next generation sequencing for the myeloid diseases to this. And so we generate a comprehensive diagnosis. The physicians actually love this. Um, they use this to show their patients and all the testing that is done and how they progress through their diseases. And so when we first initiated this, um, the uptake and the blue or the number of bone marrows over the first 50 weeks that were ordered by bone marrow testing panel. So we get, we've always allowed the providers to order either the bone marrow testing panel that turns the ordering over to the SOPs or to order a la carte. We've never taken that ability away. Um, and so the bone marrow testing panel, as you could see, had a very slow beginning. But after about 10 to 15 weeks, we've been at about 90 to 95 percent ordering via, via the SOPs since the start. And that was in, 19, um, thir in, in 2013, <laughs> making myself older than I am. Um, and so you can see that this has really shown that we are we have the provider's support and enthusiasm. And for a couple of reasons, we, we aren't causing them any extra time. We're actually saving them time. And so, as our head of hematology oncology said, when, you know, they used to have to try to go through the report and figure out what to order every time they saw a patient. We're saving them anywhere from five to 10 minutes at the time that they see the patient when they're on their first visit, and we're saving them five or 10 minutes of time at, at the time that they see the patient back for the interpretation of the report, because the system has actually done most of the work for them. And so because we're actually providing them additional benefit, value added, they really love this system and have been willing to support it. Madan Jagesha, who's the head of the Hemont group at Vanderbilt, is probably the strongest uh, supporter of the system and is encouraging everyone to actually do this. It's also generated um, some great work for our junior colleagues, and we have publications coming out um, almost every year, every other year, on the results and how these have impacted clinical care. Um, before we actually started, we did a retrospective review of the data um, and decided which SO, how the SOPs would impact ordering. Um, and what we were able to show was that early on, um, before we ever started the system, there were about 3.7 tests ordered per marrow. Um, based on our SOPs, we su that suggested that some tests that were important for either detection of minimal residual disease or prognosis or follow-up were probably missing from those orders. And there were about 1.3 unnecessary tests being ordered. So the optimal number of tests was about 1.2.8 tests, and these are those complex molecular tests or cytogenetics was probably the optimal number. At that point, uh, an economist and data analytics person actually helped us to do some of the numbers, and it really suggested that we were saving about a million dollars a year, not for Vanderbilt per se, but for the insurers of the patients at Vanderbilt, and that would have equated with about a half a billion dollars a year just for the lab test savings, and that did not conclude the time savings for our oncologist. We've now followed the data over the last five years, and every six months to every year, we iteratively improve the SOPs. And what we've been able to show, um, since we have not restricted this and told the physicians that they have to order it this way, we have the, uh, the testing ordered by the physicians compared to the testing ordered by the SOPs is our comparison. 
Um, and so over year one, you can see that we have a significant decrease in the number of tests per mara ordered when we implemented the SOPs. We then improved the SOPs, and you can see the number of total tests ordered per mara continues to decrease over time. And this is not across the board. These are for restricted disease entities, and we can talk about that. All of this data has been published in different, in different places. Um, so the number of un un unnecessary tests per mara has dramatically decreased, and the number of missing tests has really improved. Our physicians um, really are learning as part of the system. So even when they order tests on their own without using our bone marrow testing strategy, the testing is actually getting better. So this is just a timeline of, this, of the whole process. We really began some of the SOPs back in 2011. Our first publications were coming out in 2013. Um, all the stars uh, on the top are really abstracts, presentations, or manuscripts that have resulted from this. Um, we added next generation sequencing. So you know these are not static clinical decision support s systems that never change. So as the data comes in, we add additional tests. We added uh, myeloid NGS to this in, um, around in the middle of 2014. And I just wanted to show you the results a little bit of this. This is, not, this is unpublished data from Dr. Adam Sigmiller, who has been uh, critical for this effort. We, uh, we began doing a small uh, bioreference lab test of 36 genes um, at this time. And we compared the number of positive bone marrows using the SOPs when we, when we defined when NGS testing would probably be relevant to those that were simply ordered by the physician without any evidence-based guidelines. And as you can see, oops, um, the number of positives in red if it was ordered by the DMT SOP approach, about 81% of them were positive, um, whereas if it was ordered just randomly without any evidence-based guidelines or the SOPs, about 18% of them were positive, suggesting that the use of these SOPs is really tr truly remarkable and is improving testing um, and, and ultimately patient care. So ongoing work is really in two fashions. One is beginning to offer this work outside of the Vanderbilt community itself. Vanderbilt is engaged in a, in a large systems approach to healthcare and has formed the Vanderbilt Health Affiliated Network of, of collaborating hospitals um, across the southeast where there's a huge cancer burden. And we began actually offering the DMT approach to cancer uh, at Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is about halfway between Nashville and Memphis, if you don't know Tennessee very well. Um, and in 2014, we were able to, we've been actually doing that for the last three years. We do all of their esoteric testing. And the reason we're able to do that for them is that we can offer the SOPs. We're offering their comprehensive reports. Their pathologists are con continuing to do their own work. They do the morphology. We do all of the esoteric and, and put together the, the comprehensive reports for them. And it's actually saving them money because we're doing so many fewer tests than when they were sending their lab testing out to a variety of the other larger um, commercial laboratories. This so we, but we also feel that we're providing excellent patient care in the process, and we want to be able to scale this across the network. And we're now moving into larger um, solid organs. Um, we have focused recently on GI cancer. We're working with the GI oncologists and with the radiologists to really do this in GI cancer with initial focus on colorectal cancer. There are a number of you know, issues with solid tumors versus somatopathology. One, there's metastatic disease versus non-metastatic disease. There are multiple sites, multiple time points of entry into the system, multiple different sites, and multiple providers. Um, there's oncologists and gastroenterologists and radiologists and many different general surgeons and generalists that see the patients. But we're, we're really determined to focus on this, and we have initial um, you know, process workflows that we're really beginning to work on to, to be able to do this. And so in summary, um, I uh, have tried to tell you what the traditional pathways are in, in pathology and in medicine. What we've really been done is an example that I think can scale really much more broadly and to other disease processes and presented the next steps. So thank you. question or do we roll on? 
could you just tell us about the economic impact for your uh, your group, your faculty, your department? And uh, so you've achieved cost savings for the oncologist, but what kind of uh, cost have you incurred in your department? I don't have improved care. <laughs> um, I don't have exact numbers for you. Uh, we are an academic department, so you know part of this work has been on an academic mission, and so we have numbers of publications, and it's really supported our junior faculty to do this. Um, and much of their, you know, they have twenty percent of their of their time free to do this as an academic effort. But where we actually have seen, um, well, what about but, if you but, just look at the hours? How much more time does it take for an individual pathologist to uh, provide this kind of service, just in terms of hours and we can... Well, actually, right now, once the, once the, the informatics is set up to pull the data together, it is no more time. And so, you know, when we first started, um, there were some of the uh, pathologists that hated it because we were really doing this manually for probably the first six to nine months before it was all set up and they started pushing buttons and it was all that was a very painful time for all of us but at this point it's really not taking much more time or any more time at all Bravo. thank you <laughs>